All right, hey, good morning, RCC. How are we doing today? We're doing well, all you dads. Happy Father's Day. We love you guys. We want you to stand. I know we're sitting, but we want you to stand. We're going to worship the Lord today because He is worthy. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's sing out. So aimless, life every day. I want to let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Like a blind man wandered along Worries and fears I claim for my own Then like a blind man God gave back inside Praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light No more darkness No more night Now I'm so happy No sorrow inside
morning, RCC. You may be seated. At this time, if you have not received the communion elements when you walked in, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand at this moment and please keep it raised and someone will bring those elements to you. My dad is a pretty laid back man for the most part, a man who enjoys laughing while also genuinely cherishing life. And the man is definitely an individual who has never met a stranger. 
but don't let my dad's smile and laid back personality fool you. He was the master of coming up with the most creative and innovative consequences and punishments when I chose to disobey him or the rules he had in place. And in those times that I was enduring all of the ridiculously funny, probably on his part, or not so funny in my case, lesson generating consequences, I had no idea that in those moments of discipline and consequences, my dad was actually giving me great gifts of love that would position me for success, not by the world's standards, but by God's. However, the greatest gift that my dad has given to me wasn't found in him being a man's man, although I would characterize him as God's warrior and one of the strongest people that I know. The best and greatest gift wasn't found in him being a successful business professional. In fact, my dad dropped out of school when he was in seventh grade to take care of his own family. And he taught me how to read and write when he really didn't know how to do either well himself. But the best and greatest gift wasn't even found in these selfless actions. The best and greatest gifts were found in my dad introducing me to and pointing me to Jesus Christ, the only one who was going to love me like nothing and no one else ever could. And as much as my dad has sacrificed for me, the best and greatest gift he has given me is encouraging and inspiring me through his words and actions to follow in the steps of the one who made the greatest sacrifice of all time. As great of a father as my dad has been and is to me, he has intentionally encouraged me to cling tightly to my heavenly father who poured out everything on my behalf. In John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Today, as we celebrate Father's Day, but more importantly, communion, may we remember our heavenly father who is perfect in every single way. May we remember Jesus Christ, who poured out everything for the forgiveness of our sins. And may we remember that we get to live the privileged calling of being the beloved sons and daughters of the almighty creator of the world. Dad, will you pray for us? Heavenly Father, thank you, dear God, for another Father's Day. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ, that you gave his life for all of us. Thank you, dear God, and bless all your sons and daughters, spiritual and our parents first. In Jesus' name, your son, amen. Of the 
goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. who join us online. We welcome all our brothers and sisters watching online today. We love you guys so much. So much. Have a seat, please. Have a seat. Welcome to RCC. And isn't it great, this worship today? Isn't it awesome? So we're just having a great time. And a welcome to Dad Fest. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But right now, I want to welcome all of you. We'd love to hear from you. Fill out that card that's there in front of you right now. Let us know you're here. And if there's anything you'd like for us to pray about, please fill out that card. You guys online can hit the request prayer button. And uh, we uh, take that, those prayers very seriously. Our staff prays for them. Our prayer team prays for them. Our elders pray for them. And uh, we're just honored that we get to pray for anything for you. So please allow us uh, to do that. On top of that... 
You can take those cards, bring it up to the prayer team later on in our service, or you can put them in the giving box on your way out the door. Speaking of giving boxes, you can give uh, today, and let's give God first and our first fruits, and let's give him our best. And I tell you what, I've never been part of a more generous church than River Christian Church, RCC. And so I want to thank you so much for your generosity. And what you do, you have no idea the impact it's having right now over so many people right here locally and all around the world. So keep that up. You can see several ways of giving up on the screen. And uh, you can hit those giving boxes or whatever way you want to choose to give. Uh, Please do so. On top of that, we want you to know that because of generosity, RCC keeps breaking the record for the baby bottle drive. And last year, we raised over $20,000. This year, so far, we've raised 8000 So we're hoping to close that gap and break our record, and we can do that today. So you can uh, bring your baby bottles. If you forgot to bring them, it's not too late. You can bring them next week. We'll still take them and add them to that total. But those are due today to save the lives of babies and bring moms and dads and grandparents to Jesus Christ. It's an amazing ministry. Join up. First Coast Women's Services with this baby bottle drive. And today I want to encourage you, Dad Fest is happening today. So for you dads out there, we are so grateful for you and we hope you feel right at home today. Uh, we, got, um, we got all kinds of things. We got bacon out there, so don't pass on that. We got root beer floats. Uh, we got activities. If you win one of those activities, uh, obviously you get a $50 gift card to Amazon. So that's a great thing to try for. Or we'll give you one of those cars out there, or motorcycles. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. So... But anyway, I hope you'll participate in that. Go check out the cars. Go check out the bikes as well. And uh, we just want to make you feel right at home today uh, as we celebrate Father's Day. Uh, You know, uh, today I want to talk to you about a dad who's trying to figure out his son. And that's the case for a lot of us dads, trying to figure out their kids and what they're going to be and what they're going to become when they grow up. Well, this son was really having a hard time. And so his dad did a little experiment Without knowing about it, he went in his room and put on his table four items. One item was a Bible. The second item was a dollar bill. The third item was a a flask of whiskey. And the fourth item was an adult magazine. And he said, you know, if he picks up the Bible, that means he'll be a pastor. And that would be great for our family. If he picks up the dollar bill, that means he'll be a businessman. That would be okay. If he picks up the flask of whiskey and takes a drink, well, he'll be a drunken bum. And that would be terrible. If he picks up the the adult magazine, then he'll be a skirt chasing womanizer, and that would be a disgrace for our family. And so the dad hides in the the room of his son. The son eventually comes in, and the son grabs the Bible, and he puts it underneath his his arm like this, and he sees the dollar bill, and he picks it up, puts it in his pocket. He takes the whiskey, and he takes a drink of it while he's looking through the adult magazine. And the father thought to himself, oh, Lord, have mercy. He's going to run for Congress. <laughs> we love you politicians. We love you. I'm just joking. It's just a joke. So, so, you know, the thing is, like, how do I figure out who I am? Like, how do I figure that out? And here's what I would say, and that is the key to knowing who you are is knowing who your dad is, who our father is. You can't have an heir without a parent. And so, so you need to recognize that knowing who we are depends on knowing who our Heavenly Father, who God is. And no one betrayed God better, knew Him better than Jesus Christ. And so it's interesting that God is referred to Father 250 times in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, He's hard, hardly ever referred to as Father. But in the New Testament, 250 times. And what's fascinating is like, who changed that? <laughs> well, we know who changed it. Jesus did. Jesus changed it. In fact, he called Father 170 times. He called God Father 170 times in the New Testament. In fact, the first words that come out of his mouth in the New Testament are these words right here when he's talking about the temple. He says, Don't, didn't you know that I had to be in my what? In my Father's house? The last words that he said when he hung on the cross is this word, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He prayed oftentimes, he used the word Abba, And that's a big deal. That's a really big deal because, for instance, like when we teach our kids to speak, one of the first words they learn is dad, dad, right? And that's what Abba is. Abba is a term, like a little Jewish baby's learning to speak. They would go, Ab, Ab. That's what they refer to as father. For instance, Abraham, Abraham, father of nations. So Abba is the word for daddy. And that's how God would talk. That's how Jesus would talk to God. 
And he said that fundamental understanding of God is dad. Now, the problem with human metaphors is oftentimes they're inadequate. Many of us, when we talk about our father, we think of father as loving because that's our experience, just like Anthony was talking about his dad. But there's others of us in the room and online right now who look at their father and they think of abandonment, they think of cruelty. But what Jesus is trying to do is think of what a dad should be. That's what your heavenly father is and apply that to God. A dad ought to protect his children. But guess what? Our father in heaven protects his children. A dad ought to, ought to basically provide for his children. Well, our God meets our needs. A dad ought to practice resilient faith and love. There's nothing a kid can do that can make you turn your back on your children. That's why a dad ought to respond. Well, that's how our God is. A dad ought to leave an inheritance. Well, our Father in heaven has left us an inheritance. And maybe, most of all, Jesus used the word Father to describe God because it helps us figure out who we are. So if he is father, if God's father, then who am I? I grew up in the 90s in Atlanta, Georgia, and one of the guys that was really big there, many, there's a lot of great athletes in Atlanta at that time, but one of them was Evander Holyfield. He became the heavyweight champion of the world while, while I lived in Atlanta. In fact, what's interesting about Evander is that he was very small. He always wanted to fight in the heavyweight division, but he was like a cruiserweight and he couldn't figure out how to pack on weight. He never thought he'd actually be a heavyweight one day to be able to be the champion of the heavyweight division. Evander Holyfield grew up, never knew his dad. And one day his mom got him in the car and drove him to Southern Alabama, out to a lumbering town. And she took him out of the lumber yard and there was this big old 230 pound lumberjack, strong with muscles just kind of ripping all over the place. And she says to her son, she says, Evander, that's your daddy. And on that day, the image that Evander had of himself changed forever. On that day, in his mind, he became a heavyweight champion. Because once he knew who his dad was, he knew who he could be. And that's why Jesus wants you to think of God as father, because if he's father, then who am I? Well, you and I are the sons and daughters of God, amen? If he's our father, that's our identity. That's who we are. So there's some ramifications to this that I want you to know about. Number one is this. We're accepted into God's family on the basis of faith in Christ. We're accepted into God's family on the basis of faith in Christ. The ch children of God are distinguished by their relationship with the Son of God. In fact, look at John chapter 1. It says it's about Jesus. He, Jesus, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who what? Say it with me. To those who what? Believed in his name. He gave the right to become what? Children of God. So those who believed in the name of Jesus, those who believe that Jesus Christ is the son of living God, by faith they become children of God. But notice it's a gift. You can't earn this. You can't buy it. You can't do enough for it. You receive it by faith. Look, it says in Galatians chapter three, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. What? Say it with me. Through faith, for all who were baptized into Christ have clothed themselves, clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, please notice that baptism is the defining expression of faith in Jesus Christ. It's in faith that we are saved. In fact, we had nine people last week give their life to Christ and get baptized in Jesus Christ. Can we give God the praise for that? Nine people. And I think that's interesting because somebody texted me and they said, I saw the baptisms at your church. Was that a baptism Sunday? I'm like, no, it was just a regular Sunday at RCC. By faith, by faith, we become children of God. That's what baptism is, an expression of faith. Galatians chapter four says, but when the right time came, remember that, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could, say this with me, adopt us as his very own children. So let's start off with what does it mean at just the right time? Some pastors go, at just the right time means that when the Romans came in and built the roads, God could use those roads to spread the gospel. I want you to know something. God doesn't need roads to spread the gospel. Some go, okay, well, that means that when the Greeks showed up and they developed a universal language, and God needed that universal language to spread the gospel. 
No. God doesn't need a universal language to spread the gospel. What this means is God had given the people of Israel 1,500 years of law to prove once and for all, you can't get right with God by keeping law. You'll never be able to do enough. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be righteous enough under law to make yourself right with God ever. So when the time came, when the time was right, and that point was firmly established, Jesus shows up under law. The only man who ever perfectly kept the law, and that man, Jesus, redeemed you from the curse because he was put on the cross, and everything you deserve for being a lawbreaker was put on Jesus. That's why when Jesus oftentimes refers to and prays to God, he almost always refers to him as Father. 21 times he prays. He says Father when he prays. Only one time Jesus did not call God Father when he prayed. And that was when he was on the cross and he says these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like, why did he not call God father then? Because in that moment, his relationship with God was not parental, it was judicial. In that moment, Jesus was a sin bearing criminal. He took on him everything that you and I deserved and he took it on himself. And the wrath of God fell on Jesus Christ. He paid the price so that we could experience grace in our life. You know, to be a son or daughter of God is a gift of faith. And that's how you enter into the family. It's totally a gift. And it's not taken away from you once you receive it. I think of a pastor, a young pastor had a guy come up to him in his church. And the man said, Pastor, I I just feel like I'm failing as a Christian. I'm trying, but I'm not growing, and I I think I'm actually losing my salvation. And the pastor said to this man, he says, now back at my house, the pastor said, I've got a dog. That dog does everything I want. It minds me, it never makes a mess, which I'm thinking that's gonna be awesome because I got a puppy and that's the opposite right now anyway. That dog of his never made a mess. He said, but I got a baby son at home. He's a complete disaster. He gets food all over the place, dirty diapers. He's a total mess. So who's going to get my inheritance, the pastor asked. Not my dog, my son. And he said these words, and Jesus Christ died for you. And God is faithful. He never disinherits a child. And that leads us to the second point, that is we're adopted in what we might, might be co-heirs. So we might be co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Paul says that we receive the full rights of children. In the Greek, literally, it means that we receive adoption. Now, some of you are confused. You're going, okay, I'm born again into the family of God, so how then I can, how then I, how then how can I be adopted if I'm already part of the family? Well, Paul understood a very common Roman custom where a Roman father would take his son and he would take him before men in the town and he would officially adopt him. And what that meant was, I'm putting adult status on my child. And I'm declaring him, I'm declaring them as an equal heir, and he will have full access to my whole inheritance. See, the Romans didn't do inheritance like the Jews did it. Jews, what they did, if you're a firstborn, you got a double portion of the inheritance, which I'm all for because I'm a firstborn. I would love to get a double portion of the inheritance. But that's not how this works. So in the Romans, what they did was you had equal heirs. You had equal inheritance, you know, and and this goes further than that in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that we're equal heirs. The Bible says that we are co-heirs. So what's the difference? Well, let's just say that my dad owned a big piece of property in West Texas with a whole bunch of oil fields on it. Now he doesn't, just say he did. And, and, And that's gonna be our inheritance. And in the will, it says, Nathan gets half the land, and my little brother, my dad's other son, Nick, gets the other half of the land. In that case, we would be equal heirs. But suppose the will said this, both boys get the whole ranch together, everything on it. In that case, we are co-heirs, not equal heirs. And that's what the Bible says that we are. We are co-heirs. Look what it says in Romans chapter 8. Now, for children then we are heirs, heirs of God, and what? Say it with me, and co-heirs. Co-heirs with Christ. It is impossible to be God's child and not be his heir. 
Now, it is possible in our world that you could have a child and not allow them to be an heir of you. You can do that. But God, with God, it is impossible to be his child and not be one of his heirs, co-heirs with Christ. You ask, okay, so what in the world are we going to inherit? Matthew chapter 5 says we're going to inherit the whole earth. Matthew chapter 19 says that we are going to inherit eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that we're going to inherit the kingdom of God. But the simplest way to understand this is this. Whatever Jesus gets, we're going to get. Whatever God gives to Jesus, he's going to give to us because we're co-heirs. Okay, so what's Jesus going to get? Hebrews chapter 1 says this. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed, say it with me, what? Heir of all things. Jesus is heir of all things, and through him also he made the universe. In other words, what he's saying is everything that is, everything that exists, every square square molecule in the universe, visible and invisible, God is going to give to Jesus, and he's going to give it to you too. There's going to be a no trespassing sign. There's going to be no, no trespassing signs in heaven. When someone says, you know, I'm sorry, but this part of heaven is my part of heaven. (laughs) Nobody's going to be able to say that because it's all ours. Because it all belongs to Jesus. And you get it all. Now, I'm doing a a terrible job right now, bad job explaining this because you're looking at me like I'm talking about tax returns or something. You should be really excited right now. Someone should be saying amen because I just told you that God is going to give you everything that he is going to give to Jesus. Aren't you excited about that? I know I am. He's going to give and he's going to treat every believer like he treats Jesus. And it's going to be an act of grace because you don't earn inheritance, right? You only receive inheritance if you're an heir of a parent. I think about a JFK, when John F. Kennedy was running for president in 1960, he went in West Virginia and he talked to a coal miner. A coal miner looked at him and said, son, I wanna know something. Is it true that you're a son of one of the richest men in America? And JFK Jr. said, yes, sir, it's true. He said, okay. Is it true that, when, that you've never had to work hard with your hands one single day of your life? And Kennedy said, yes, sir, that's true. And the miner looked him up and down and said, son, let me tell you something. You haven't missed a thing. It's good to get inheritance, isn't it? And we got an incredible inheritance for us. Look at this in 1 Peter chapter 1. And we have a, what? A priceless inheritance. A priceless inheritance. Inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of, of, of change beyond the reach of decay. Paul says, says this in Romans, what's prepared for us, said, yet what we suffer now. Now I want to stop there because many of you are suffering right now. Many of you are carrying big burdens. I've got a, 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 a wristband on my arm from a funeral I did this past week from somebody in our church lost their 30-year-old daughter to cancer. And we did our funeral this this week right here. Some of you are carrying tremendous burdens right now, but listen to what this says. Yet what we suffer right now is nothing compared to the glory, say it with me, he will reveal to us later. I know you're going through incredible problems right now, but the Bible says when you think about your inheritance as a son and daughter of God, it should help you keep all your problems in perspective. But God knew that there'd be days when when we just don't feel like an heir. When we just don't feel like one of his children. So there's one more thing. This is really big that we need to know. Here it is. We're anointed by the Spirit to seal our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're anointed by the Spirit to seal our relationship with Jesus Christ. When I was in college, I worked as a youth intern for a church underneath a student pastor. And the student pastor had a four-year-old and, uh, and I went to his house and they had just gotten, they had just bought the VHS tape of the, of the movie called Lion King. Remember VHS tapes? This was back in the 90s. And so that kid watched Lion King probably 57 times in the first week. And if you remember in the movie, there's that scene where the big daddy lion, Mufasa, speaks to his younger lion son, Simba. And in a deep lion voice, he says these words, remember you are my son. 
And that little kid, I'd hear him all over the church saying over and over for the next month, I'd hear him saying, the little four-year-old, remember, you are my son. It meant a lot to him. It meant a lot to all of us. Because you see, for Simba to become who he is meant to be, he has to realize that he is a royal son, that he comes from royalty. Our God wants you to realize the same thing. So do you know what he did? Galatians chapter four. And because we are his children, God has sent the what? God has sent the spirit, look at this, of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out what? Abba, Father. Now you're no longer a slave, but God's what? Own child. And since you are a child, God has made you his heir. God has sent the spirit in your heart to remind you of your status in the royal family and of the assurance of your inheritance. His spirit in you is the first installment guaranteeing what is to come. It says in Ephesians chapter one, the spirit is what? God's guarantee that he will give us inheritance. He promised. Romans chapter eight, it says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, through Jesus, you receive what? God's spirit. When, you, when he adopted you as his own children, now we call him Abba, Father, Daddy. For what? His spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are what? Say it with me. We are God's children. I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says. It says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the what? The Holy Spirit. And that's why the Spirit, every single day, if you'll stop and you listen, just you stop and be still, you will hear two messages every single day from the Spirit of God and hear those two messages. Number one is this, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Will you say that with me like lions on the count of three? One, two, three, say it with me. Jesus is my Lord. And message two is this. God is my Father. Say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. God is my Father. Every day, you need to stop and be still and listen to the Holy Spirit so that you can be reminded of these two messages. See, our problem, I think, is not thinking too highly of ourselves. I think our problem is thinking too cheaply of ourselves. We don't live like royal kids about to inherit everything. Oftentimes we live puny, scared, cautious, petty lives of discipleship like we're not even sure of our future. Reminds me of Marion Rothschild, one of Europe's at the time richest men, and he's on a carriage ride and the driver drops him off, and he tips the driver, and the driver says to him, well, uh, sir, your son always tips me more than this. And Rothschild looked at him, reminded him, he said, well, he can afford to. He's got a rich dad, and I don't. <laughs> You've got a rich dad. You've got a rich dad. You can afford to live bold, big, brave lies for Jesus. You should live every day like it's Father's Day. And I know for some of you, this whole idea that God is loving, it's just hard for you to wrap your arms around that idea because of your experience with your dad. And I hope today that you'll let the Holy Spirit help you by faith believe that you got a heavenly father that's, that's always ready to wrap his arms around you. One of our elders, Tim Queen, Many of you know him, grew up in a not an ideal home. His dad really wasn't around. Now I want you to hear his story as he talks about how that did not impact how he views God as a loving father. Check out this video. My relationship with my dad um, was really um, centered on the fact that I was the youngest of five. So as the youngest of five, um, people think that, you know, the youngest child's always the coolest, always the best, gets everything. But in my relationship, I think, you know, it was kind of the, the end of the trail for us. So my mom and dad, they were married for about 10 years before they had me. And my dad was, my earliest memories of him was so focused on himself. He was focused on his studies. He was focused on baseball. He was focused on those things that really were about him. And as I grew older and I got to about the third grade when my parents were separated, um, I realized that my dad was really never present. He was always doing something for himself. I never saw him around the rest of the family, let alone myself. 
He was just always constantly pursuing things outside of the family. Looking back at my relationship with my father, I knew that when I got married that I wanted to do things different. Uh, for me, never seeing my father really interact with my mom, um, it just, it left a bit of a question in my head, like what's the role of a dad, what's the role of a father? And that really, for me, began with the fact that I wanted to have a really strong relationship with my wife. Because I knew as a kid, I wanted to have both mom and dad at home, have them be present. So for me, it was focusing first on my wife, uh, first on that relationship. So I knew if I could get that right, uh, which I always don't get right, perfect, that my children would be able to see an example of what a good relationship could be. And that would make it easier for me and my wife to be able to be the sort of parents that our kids needed. So, you know, my dad and his absence really instructed me to maybe at times maybe over-index or be more focused on my kids uh, and my wife than I would have without having had that experience with him. Or may I say, maybe without that experience with him. You know, even though my dad wasn't around, I still was able to see God as being loving and available and part of my life. Because I think we're all born with this understanding about how we should treat others, but also how we should be treated. It's not something that's really kind of learned. We all know what it is to feel hurt, um, to not be loved or be respected. So and that, I think, sits with all of us. So for me, it was never a question but the fact that was God present, was God really in my life, but rather the fact that I recognized that God was the loving Father that I didn't have on earth. And I was also blessed by having other men in my life, like my grandfather, um, that really showed me what it was like to actually be the sort of man you needed to be around other people, including your wife, including your children, but just people uh, that you meet every day. So to anyone here today that's maybe struggling um, with putting in perspective their earthly father and also their relationship with God, I would tell you that we oftentimes, I know I do, look to put my, you know, my faith in other people or try to find hope or heroes in other people. And that's just not workable. People will fall short. We're, we're sinners. Whereas God is consistent. God is always going to be there for us. And I find that, that pursuing that relationship with God allows me to really be focused on what my life looks like and what it should be versus being disappointed and chasing people or ideas that, that frankly aren't rooted in anything other than being selfish. So for me, it's just rooting myself in a relationship with God first and foremost. Can we give God praise for Tim's testimony? I don't know your story. I don't know what kind of dad you have, but I do know this. There's only one time in the whole Bible that God is viewed as in a hurry. And it's a time when his lost child is coming home and he's running out to get to him. He's running out to hug him. See, God is always persistent and always moving in the direction of his children. And God has been running after many of you for many years. That tug in your heart, I want you to know that's your heavenly father prompting you, calling you because he's pursuing you. He's been pursuing you for a long time. And I'll tell you something else. God will never say, he'll never say, I'll love you if. <laughs> he'll never say that. He may disapprove of your behavior, but he will never disinherit a child. So what in the world does God get for loving us like this? He gets us. He gets us for, to be honest with you, that, that's, that's, what, that's what a father who loves his children, that's all he wants is his children. And you're never going to figure out who you are until you know who your daddy is. So I'm gonna close one of my favorite stories of all time. It's from uh, Fred Craddock. He and his wife are in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And he's there and he's having a nice little dinner with his, his wife, just the two of them, and kind of hoping to keep it that way, just the two of them, this quaint little country restaurant in Gatlinburg. There's this white-haired, distinguished gentleman who's kind of walking around the restaurant, going from table to table, and Fred remembers thinking, well, I hope he doesn't come to our table. Well, of course he does. And he asks, he says, where are you guys from? And they say, Oklahoma. And he says, well, that's a nice state. What do you do there? He says, well, I, I, I teach a theological school. Oh, you teach pastors. I got a story for you. And he sits down at the table. And they're like, oh, great. That's all blown out of the water. Another preacher story. That's what pastors love to hear, another preacher story. He said, my name's Ben Hooper, 
And I grew up in these mountains right here. I never knew my daddy. My mom never married, and that was a big scandal when I was in school. The kids had a name for me. It wasn't a very nice name. So I spent a lot of time by myself, so I wouldn't have to hear that name. Worse than that was going in town to get supplies. I'd go in and supplies and get, get supplies, and I'd see people staring at me, and they'd always ask the same question. I wonder who his daddy is. I learned that if I went to church, if I showed up late and left early, nobody would stare at me. Nobody would talk to me. So that's what I would do. And about 12 years of age, we got a new pastor at our church. So I'm leaving early like I always did, leaving early out of service. And all of a sudden, I felt this, felt this big old hand on my shoulder. And I turned around, and it was that new pastor. He was a big man. And I looked, at, I looked up at him, and he asked me, he said, whose boy are you? Who's your daddy? And Ben said, I looked down in shame. And when I looked back up, he had a big old smile on his face. And he said, wait a second. I recognize you. I see the family resemblance. You are a child of God. And he slapped Ben Hooper on the back and he said, son, go out and claim your inheritance. And Ben Hooper said to Fred Craddock at that restaurant, he said, I'm Ben Hooper. And that one sentence changed my life. And he got up from the table and he left. And Fred said this, I remember thinking how the people of Tennessee had elected twice a man who did not know who his daddy was, named Ben Hooper, to be their governor. You got to know who your dad is to know who you are. And it seems like today, Father's Day, will be a great day to head towards your dad. Head towards your heavenly father. Will you stand with me? Let me pray over you. Father, I feel the pain of being a dad who's trying to get to his child. But his child would not turn around to receive a hug. And Lord, right now, There's some children in this room, there's some children right now online of yours that have been running from you. And Lord, my prayer for them is for them to turn around and see a dad run towards them. Not out of anger, not out of guilt, not out of shaming them, but out of pure love that we've been looking for our entire lives. Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit to convict and I pray for people to finally come home to their dad this Father's Day. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus, and the whole church said, amen. If you wanna come home, I want you to know our prayer team is up here. They would love to receive you and, and maybe today is the day you say, you know what, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ for the very first time or maybe you're coming back to God. It's time to come back home. Maybe you have a joy, a concern that you wanna share with our prayer team. They're up here right now. But can we give our God just praise for being the dad that we've always wanted, for being the perfect father. Let's worship him together. Please come as we stand and sing.
Sing this with us. You turn morning. You turn morning to bed. value you. We pray today has been edifying for you. As you make your way out, don't forget we have the baby bottles out there. Also, guys, we have all kinds of activities, games out in the South Lawn. Go be a blessing to others. We'll see you soon.